Uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, Andy, who heads the uh, pancreatic cancer program at the University of Michigan. Andy. Thanks, Rupam. So, so I'd like to first thank Rupam for saving me um, from another dinner I had to go to uh, with a lot less quality food and some more boring people. <laughs> AACR didn't hear that, by the way. So, um, so I'd like to thank uh, Rain Dance and Rupam for the invitation to uh, present some really exciting data that we, that we just got hot off the presses about a couple weeks ago, uh, where we're using Thunderbolt-enabled uh, sequencing now to analyze very low amounts of DNA from pancreatic cyst fluid. So my laboratory is interested in understanding the cellular and molecular events that occur when a precancerous lesion decides to turn into a cancer, um, in the pancreas, that is. Um, and it's our hope that by understanding this biology, we can then develop new assays to achieve earlier diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. 80% of patients who are diagnosed with pancreas cancer will have, lo will have locally advanced or metastatic disease, um, and as well as to uh, alter um, patient treatment. So there are two major precancerous lesions of the pancreas. The first is the pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia, or the panin lesion. Uh, this can lead to ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, and they're microscopic, uh, making them impossible to detect on CT scans, MR, or endoscopic ultrasound. So here, the challenge clinically is to detect uh, pan and lesions that we cannot detect on any current assay. The opposite is true for the more common pancreas cancer, uh, pancreatic precancerous lesion, um, which are cystic lesions, and specifically we'll talk about IPMN lesions or interductal papillary mucinous neoplasias. Here, these lesions can devolve into cyst adenocarcinomas or ductal adenocarcinomas, but in contrast to panin lesions, these lesions are readily detectable on CT scan or MRI. Uh, they have a fluid-filled uh, component, uh, which provides really nice contrast to be able to pick these up in a pancreas CT or a pancreas MR. Um, <clears throat> and with the increasing utilization of CT scans or MRIs over the past two decades, we've seen an explosion in the diagnosis of IPMN incidentally in our patients. Um, seems like any time you have a stomach ache or itch and you walk into the ER, you get a CT scan of, or an MRI. Uh, that's, the physical, that's the physical exam that we use now. Um, be that as it may, we have an incidence now of about one in a thousand Americans over the age of 60 being diagnosed with IPMN lesions. But only a small portion of these lesions will progress to cancer, and hence, that is the clinical conundrum that's facing gastroenterologists, radiologists, and surgeons. Because if we can catch these IPMNs early enough, we can prevent them from actually advancing to cancer just by cutting them out, either by a distal pancreatectomy or a pancreaticoduodenectomy or a Whipple procedure. Uh, but the problem is, is that we kind of need our pancreases to digest the filet mignon that we just ate. Um, and to control our blood sugars. So patients who undergo these surgeries, these really big surgeries, are at really high risk for developing uh, brittle diabetes and malabsorptive disorders. Um, so if we can catch these IP, IP men's early enough, we can do the surgery, save them from a cancer, but we usually introduce another disease in this place. Now there are in place clinical criteria that dictate which patients we should send for surgery because we think that these IPMNs look nasty or worrisome. Um, and these criteria, which are called Sendai criteria, are basically um, opinions of a, con of a consensus panel. Um, and they have very little clinical evidence for their use. Um, be that as it may, it's based on the radiographic appearance of these cystic lesions on CT scan or MRI, as well as cytology of cyst fluid. But these criteria are deficient, and that's putting it mildly. Uh, these criteria have very poor sensitivity. Um, only about 10% of all IPMNs that are Sendai criteria negative or deemed clinically benign will progress to cancer. On the other side, we know that they have very poor specificity. So of all the IPMN lesions that are cut out because they are Sendai criteria positive, only 60% will have advanced pathology um, in the form of dysplasia or, carcin or invasive carcinoma. Now, another way of saying this is that four out of 10 patients who are getting their pancreases cut are doing so for benign pathology. And so we're doing a lot of procedures 
uh, uh, we're doing a lot of procedures on patients for pretty much no reason. And this rate is going to increase as we do more and more CT scans and MRI. So it's clear that we need to develop better ways to predict whether or not an IPMN lesion that we, that we detect incidentally on CT scan or MRI will progress to cancer. Um, and we've been, um, we've been inspired by uh, work from the uh, Kinsler and Vogelstein groups in which they've uh, done exome sequencing of cyst lesions taken from patients um, who have advanced carcinoma or benign disease. And what they're able to show is that KRAS and gene as mutations are highly associated with advanced pathology. And so the question that we want to address in our laboratory is whether or not we can use this information to then predict which of these patients will have invasive or dysplastic pathology before the decision of surgery is made. Now, as I mentioned, uh, these, these lesions are, are fluid filled and we can access this fluid quite easily using endoscopic ultrasound and non-invasive procedure. But there are plenty of obstacles in trying to do genetic analysis of pancreatic cyst fluid. Um, first, the sample is limited. A one centimeter lesion will yield about one milliliter of fluid. Um, and most of this fluid is already dedicated to preordained analyses. And this is based on current clinical standards and SINAI criteria. So every time we do an endoscopic ultrasound and we get fluid, we are uh, bound to send about 0.5 to 1 milliliter for cyto cytologic analysis. And we're also bound to send 0.5 to 1 milliliter for tumor marker analysis, neither of which are terribly sensitive for the detection of invasive pathology or dysplasia within these lesions. But any sort of clinical trial that may arise that we may think of, that we think that will usurp send that criteria needs to be able to be done within this context, within this um, current, uh, current uh, clinical standard. Moreover, data from uh, a colleague of mine, Michelle Anderson at the University, University of Michigan, has shown that pancreatic cyst fluid contains plenty of inhibitors of routine PCR reactions, uh, making it very difficult to deal with here. And finally, if we're talking about something that could potentially be uh, incorporated into clinical diagnostics, the workflow needs to be streamlined and technically simple. So it's in this context that we turn to the Thunderbolts panel. Um, and so this is, uh, so I'll be presenting pilot data um, driven by my postdoc, uh, Angelina Landana Joshi, who was fresh out of her uh, PhD thesis just in June. So she joined the lab in July and she had little in the way of genomics experience, and yet she was able to drive uh, this project. Um, so here the hypothesis is that we can uh, obtain a genetic signature found in about 10 microliters of cis fluid, corresponding to 10 to 50 uh, nanograms of DNA. And so here we would like to find a genetic signature that can distinguish between benign and advanced pathology in resected sendai positive cis lesions. And so this, this pilot trial involved uh, looking at five cis fluid samples from patients who eventually underwent surgery. Uh, we prepared uh, DNA, extracted it, and performed Thunderbolt's targeted amplification, library construction, and sequencing. We confirmed the mutations by digital PCR, and then we compared the genetic signatures to the resulting pathology. So here is the standard data. It looks very similar to what you've seen before. Um, and we see that, um, we see the five different samples um, but we have very similar data, no matter if we put in 50 nanograms or 8 nanograms. We get very uniform coverage and deep coverage at that, going out to almost 200x for almost all the targets. In terms of mutation uh, detection, we got some very interesting data. So in samples 4 and 5, we found benign pathology. And here, not surprisingly, we could not find any mutations. But in the three samples in which we found advanced pathology, invasive carcinoma or dysplasia, we find that every single one had either a codon 12 KRAS mutation or a codon 201 GNAS mutation. In addition, we found additional mutations in the sample containing invasive carcinoma. Now we were able to validate these mutations uh, using droplet digital PCR. Here we're using TACMAN assays um, right off the shelf. Um, and here we find, find in sample one with the invasive carcinoma uh, a 26% minor, minor allelic frequency. We find 0% um, events 
um, in the uh, benign sample. And similar to what um, the others have shown, we see extremely high concordance in a low frequency estimation with droplet digital PCR with the sequencing data. Now what was really interesting to us is that we compared these data to a send out test that many people in the field used uh, from a laboratory that specializes in detecting KRS mutations uh, from pancreas cyst fluid. And what we're able to see here is that only one of the three samples in which we were able to find KRAS mutations using two complementary methods um, were uh, uh, KRAS mutations were, be able to, were able to be detected. So our future directions, we're designing a pancreas-specific Thunderbolts panel. Um, there are some mutations that we see in cyst lesions in ductal adenocarcinoma that are not represented under the current Thunderbolts panel and we are working with the company um, to uh, design this. Um, and once we have this, um, we have buy-in from our institution to be able to do a clinical trial, comparing the clinical um, utility of Synec criteria with Thunderbolts-enabled sequencing, as well as targeted mutation analysis using droplet digital PCR. All right, so I've shown you data today that Thunderbolts-enabled uh, targeted sequencing can be done with as little as eight nanograms of input DNA from a fluid that's really difficult to work with, pancreatic cyst fluid. Um, and this corresponds to actually 10 microliters of cyst fluid itself. And this allows us now to begin to think about genetic analysis of extremely small lesions that are being picked up on CT scans and MRI as well. And we've been able to show um, support for our hypothesis. Um, here we, we were able to show that KRS and GNS mutations certainly do correlate with the presence of worrisome pathology and cystic lesions. So this work was driven by, again, my first-year postdoc, Angelina Joshi, with help from Stacey Coleman um, and our key collaborators uh, from Michigan, but mostly from Raindance, um, especially Rachel Roll, who's uh, been able to help us with some of the intricacies of the protocols and the funding shown here. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. So I have two questions. The first one, how do you explain the lack of sensitivity of the uh, outsourced assay? I mean, your mutations were present at 20, 25 percent. I mean, they should be able to get out. You don't need digital drop in PCR. All right. That was, that was the, the exact discussion we had on our phone call. I don't know why, this is, these are the data. Um, I can only do some hand waving to say that there, the cyst fluid ha has bona fide PCR um, inhibitors um, that may not be relevant in our, in our raindrop uh, enabled uh, assays. And the second question I had is, what is it gonna take to change the standard of care in your institution? Yeah, so we need to be able to show, it's, to tell you the truth, the bar is gonna be low because the current clinical criteria are just horrible. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. We're still in very early days. So if you run 100 patients and you show the perfect correlation between the presence of mutation and the, uh, and the disease, then they're going to change the standard of care? Well, we'd have to get it clear certified and whatnot. But yeah, it's, 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 it's a process that we are purposely not thinking about at this point. We just want to see if it works. <laughs> The question of the outsourced, uh, outsourced samples, that was overrun. There's a difference between what the allele frequency is versus what the absolute overlooking detection is. One hypothesis might be that while the allele frequencies aren't that large and should be detectable, there could be an issue with just that little amount of cyst fluid where you're sure. running into an absolute limit of detection yeah. issue with sure. whatever technology they used. Sure. You know, it's not just about allele frequency, it's what is the minimum level. That's that would be my hypothesis. Just, uh, we've seen that before. Absolutely. Also, in your description of those two challenges and the diseases, you mentioned the micro processes. Yeah, so, so, so we know, actually, we actually had a, had a paper come out last month where we're, we do some circling tumor cell analysis as well. 
And we've been, we've been able to show that in, a port, in about 30% of patients with these benign cystic lesions with no clinical diagnosis of cancer, we're finding detectable numbers of circulating pancreas epithelial cells in the bloodstream. Now, whether or not these cells represent early metastasis, we don't know. Um, but this is another application of the raindrop that we plan to be using, because we can capture these cells and ask the question whether or not they kind of look or smell like cancer cells um, by performing very low, uh, low input uh, genetic analysis from these cells. Yeah. That's right. That's right. All right. Thank you.